The prophet Zechariah is one of more than 30 men named Zechariah in the Bible. His name means Yahweh has remembered, which could also be used to summarize the prophetic work that carries his name. We know little of Zechariah aside from the fact that he was a priest and a prophet and lived at the same time as Zerubbabel and the prophet Haggai. The book of Zechariah shares several similarities with the book of Haggai. Indeed, Zechariah 8 could easily have come from the mouth of the previous prophet. This is unsurprising given that Haggai and Zechariah overlapped by one month, with Zechariah picking up right where Haggai left off. To begin with, if Haggai is one of the easier minor prophets to grasp, Zechariah is one of the most difficult. Zechariah lived between 520 and 470 BC, during Judah's restoration, when the exiles had returned from Babylon and were rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. When reading the book of Zechariah, two words spring to mind, vision and purpose. This prophet, whose name means the Lord remembers, tells Israel that God does remember his covenant with them and will fulfill his portion of it if the people will only do their part. Zechariah, like his early contemporary Haggai, calls on the people to complete the work of reconstructing the temple. He witnessed their laziness as Haggai did, but instead of an angry rebuke, he encouraged them by imagining how it would affect their future. The temple had been half finished for about a dozen years, and God charged Zechariah with promoting its completion through the use of a metaphor. The rising of the temple pictured their lives. One day, the Messiah would dwell in this temple and eventually in them. So, both the temple and their lives must be given top priority. As they worked on both, they built their future. The word vision is essential in this text. Between chapters 1 and 6, Zechariah has eight visions. But despite his various visions, he had only one priority. All of these visions encouraged the people to repent and return to God. Like any great leader, Zechariah understands the need to cast a compelling vision for the people to act on. These images shock people and inspire them to finish what they started. The prophet Zechariah delivered a message of inspiration and encouragement to a people crushed and demoralized by years of captivity, persecution, and occupation, so that his people may continue rebuilding God's temple. It had halted previously due to hostility from the enemy. Zechariah's ministry begins in the second year of Darius, king of the Persian Empire. Of course, all Jews were familiar with Darius because the Persian Empire ruled over Judah. When he states the word of the Lord came to him, Zechariah reminds his readers that the king is in heaven. When you've reached the end of your rope, the word of the Lord is more important than anything else. God's word brings God's presence, and God's presence brings God's power, and God's power brings God's rescue. Zechariah begins by reminding his audience how they got into this mess. The Lord was furious with their forefathers. After years of disobedience and idolatry, the Lord drove his people from the country and exiled them. The people's catastrophic position was directly tied to their father's acts. They had no influence over their forefathers' decisions, but they could respond to the Lord. As a result, God tells them through his prophet, Return to me, and I will return to you. God still asks us to repent and have faith today, and if we respond to him, we may expect him to be mighty on our behalf. God had instructed their forefathers to repent of their sinful ways and deeds. Despite God's amazing patience and repeated threats of judgment through his prophets, Israel and Judah refused to heed. They also paid a hefty fine. So God inquires of the people, where are your ancestors now? That's an obvious one. They were no longer alive. Didn't my words and ordinances overwhelm your forefathers? While their forefathers believed they could disdain God and get away with it, they had been proven incorrect. People are grass, Isaiah remarks. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but God's word endures forever. So don't mess with God's word. There will only be one winner and it will not be you. The people to whom Zechariah was preaching discovered something their forefathers had not. As a result, they confessed their personal faults and accepted the circumstances that God had handed them. 
Kingdom repentance is the first step in pursuing God's kingdom agenda. The next time the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah three months later, he was to deliver a series of eight visions. In the first vision, he looked out in the night and saw a man riding a chestnut horse. Behind him were other horses. An angel told Zechariah that he would explain what he saw in response to his question. The prophet was granted access to the angelic activities. As a result, the hidden spiritual world that impacts the visible physical world is briefly laid open before our eyes. It serves as a reminder that even when we believe nothing is happening, God is always at work. These are the riders sent by the Lord to police the land. After completing their patrol, they reported to the Lord's angel that all was well. Of course, the all-knowing God does not require angels to alert him of the state of the globe. Nonetheless, he created them to serve him and humanity, and they must report to him. If angels must answer for their work to the Lord, how much more will followers of Jesus Christ have to account for their service to the king and his kingdom one day? The angel asked the Lord how long he would refuse mercy to Jerusalem, the city with whom he had been furious for 70 years. The Lord's consoling words suggest that his wrath was complete. After all, the Lord had promised through the prophet Jeremiah, when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. The time of exile had come to an end. That the Lord was highly jealous to Jerusalem indicates his intense love for his people. Though he was a little angry with them, the nations he'd used to punish had arrogantly made the destruction worse. So God promised to build his house. With this promise, Zechariah would encourage those in Jerusalem to persevere in their work on the temple, for God would be with them. That's fantastic news, but there's more here than a cursory glance will tell. The Lord says, I have returned to Jerusalem, according to the CSB. However, the original Hebrew can also be interpreted as a future verb, I will return to Jerusalem. The Lord's impending return to Jerusalem alludes to the Messiah's arrival to rule on his throne in the Millennial Kingdom. Zechariah is to declare that the towns of Judah will once again be prosperous and that they will be the recipients of God's benevolence. In the second vision, Zechariah saw four horns and four craftsmen. The horns are the nations that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. The craftsmen are the nations that would come to cut off the horns that attacked the land. God had given a promise regarding the nations of the world and their relationship to his people. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. These nations experienced the power of God's curse. In Zechariah's third vision, he saw a man with a measuring line whose job was to measure Jerusalem to determine its width and length. Such dimensions would be determined by measuring the city's walls. In previous years, Jerusalem had formidable walls to provide defense against enemies. But the fact that the Jews had been exiled was proof that the walls could be, and had been, breached. However, due to the large number of people and livestock, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls in the future. In the impending kingdom of the Messiah, the city will be overrun with people. There will be no need for walls in that day, for Jerusalem will be protected by something unbreakable and eternal. God himself will be a wall of fire around it and the splendor within it. The idea of a wall of fire protecting God's people is reminiscent of the pillar of fire God used to protect Moses and the children of Israel as they left Egypt. The Egyptian army was a huge worldly superpower, but it was nothing in comparison to the Creator God. Similarly, the Lord ensures the safety of His city throughout the millennium. Despite the fact that Jerusalem will be overrun with people, they will not be afraid because God Himself will serve as a protective wall. The Lord then exhorts the remaining Jews in Babylon to return to Jerusalem. Get away from the land of the north. You who live with daughter Babylon must flee. Why? Those who'd plunder Judah would be the object of God's wrath. I am raising my hand against them, and they will become plunder for their own servants. 
God welcomes his people home and promises vengeance on their enemies. Daughter Zion, rejoice and be pleased, for I am coming to live among you. Jerusalem will be exalted when the Messiah visits the city during his millennial reign. Gentiles will adore the Messiah with believing Jews at that time. On that day, many nations will join the Lord and become his people. Then Israel will be transformed into the Holy Land that it was intended to be. When the Messiah returns to earth to lead his kingdom, all humanity will submit to his authority. Those who saw their country in ruins heard the promise of a great coming kingdom that would bring hope, encouragement, and comfort. The fourth vision was about Joshua, who became high priest in Jerusalem after returning from exile. Zechariah saw Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan accusing him on his right side. Satan is the Hebrew word that means adversary. It is also used as a proper name to refer to the one known in Scripture as the evil one, the devil, the ancient serpent, and the great dragon. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, New International Version And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Satan was originally a righteous angel who fell from favor after rebelling against the Lord. He has established a competing kingdom in opposition to God as the supreme demon. He is referred to as the God of this age, the master of the forces of the air, and the one who deceives the entire world. He tempted Adam and Eve to reject God's word, and he continues to do so today. He wants to obstruct God's kingdom's work in the world. One of the primary ways Satan opposes God's kingdom is through acting as the accuser of our brothers and sisters, accusing them day and night before God. We see Satan's accusing activity in Job's life, and we see it again in Zechariah. However, when Satan stood beside Joshua to accuse him, the Lord came to Joshua's defense and rebuked Satan. Joshua's unclean clothes indicated his transgressions before God, but the Lord's angel removed the high priest's inequity and clothed him in festive robes and a clean turban, removing his sin. With God's purifying act completed, he commanded Joshua to follow in his ways, obey his commands, and manage his house, the temple. Though Satan is a liar and the father of lies, John chapter 8, verse 44, his charges are sometimes correct when he brings out our wickedness. Enter Jesus Christ's redemptive work on the cross to pardon believers and set them free from the bonds of sin. Despite Satan's constant attacks, Christians have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. And, because of the purifying power of Christ's blood, we may complete the kingdom's responsibilities that God has assigned us. He summons you to repentance, walking in his ways, and keeping his mandates in order for him to provide you access to his kingdom power and return you to your kingdom place and purpose. This is the proper reaction to God's grace. The cleaning of the high priest Joshua and his fellow priests was a message from God that his servant, the branch, was on the way. A keen reader of the Old Testament will recognize this as a messianic reference. God promised David that a line of kings would descend from him, eventually leading to a king with an immortal throne and dominion. However, because the majority of the Davidic monarchs sinned against the Lord, they faced God's wrath when Judah was driven into exile by Babylon. Nevertheless, God promised, A shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, David's father, and a branch from its roots will bear fruit. Though the Davidic dynasty had experienced the acts of God's judgment, the stump and its roots were still there, and a branch would grow, the branch of the Lord, the Messiah. The fact that the priests had returned from exile and were once again serving the Lord according to Zechariah, was a physical proof that the branch, the messianic king, would come. When he establishes his kingdom on earth, he will remove Israel's sin and offer it peace and prosperity. The fifth vision depicted a gold lampstand with a dish on top. It featured seven lamps with seven spouts each. This lampstand could clearly contain a large amount of oil as it had a total of 49 lit wicks. That is one incredibly brilliant lampstand. There were two olive trees on either side of it, but the prophet couldn't figure out what they meant. 
The angel interpreted the vision for Zechariah by delivering him a word from the Lord for Zerubbabel, the ruler of Judah and David's descendant in charge of the temple's reconstruction. Not by might or strength, but by my spirit. The Jews in Jerusalem had suffered great opposition and discouragement. Therefore, if Zerubbabel were to construct the temple, it would be via the supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit rather than human might. As a result, the copious oil that supplied the dazzling lampstand symbolized the overflowing strength of God's Spirit. Given the divine assistance of His Spirit, the Lord promised that His hands would finish the temple just as Zerubbabel's had set the foundation. The angel assured Zechariah that the seven eyes of the Lord, which scan throughout the whole earth, will rejoice when they see the ceremonial stone in Zerubbabel's hands. The Lord had not providentially brought the Jews back from exile simply to see them fail. He would ensure that the work would be accomplished. With that knowledge, Zechariah could confidently encourage Zerubbabel and the Jews to continue the task God had given them. As you attempt to participate in God's kingdom work in the world, keep God's words to Zechariah in mind, not by strength or might, but by my spirit. Human effort can take you only so far. The only way to be empowered to do God's work is through the Holy Spirit. When Zechariah inquired about the two olive trees seen in the vision, the angel explained that they were the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Who exactly are they? In the Old Testament, kings and priests were anointed. So, in the days of Zechariah, the anointed ones would be Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the Davidic governor, because Jerusalem was ruled by Persia and could not have its own king. The lampstand, empowered by the Holy Spirit, would then symbolize Israel. However, the angel also seems to be pointing Zechariah to a yet future time. For these two anointed ones stand by the Lord of the whole earth, in the Messianic Kingdom, Israel will rebuild the Millennial Temple. Then they will fulfill their role as a light to the nations as the Messiah, who is both king and priest, rules all on behalf of the Lord of the earth. Zechariah's sixth vision was of a flying scroll, 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. The scroll is the curse that is going out over the whole land. It represents the judgment of God's word symbolically covering Israel. It will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely. It will stay inside his house and destroy it. In other words, the Lord's judgment is all-encompassing and does not allow for any to escape. He will deal once and for all with the sinful transgression of his law when the Messiah comes and establishes his kingdom. Zechariah then had a seventh vision, a measuring basket with a lead cover symbolizing Israel's sin. Wickedness was a woman who lived inside. Two additional women with wings were transporting the basket to Shinar to construct a shrine for it to be placed on its pedestal. When God's punishment falls on Israel's crimes, the nation's wickedness will be transferred to the place of destruction, Shinar, that is, Babylon. In the coming kingdom ruled by the Messiah, there will be no room for wickedness. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I looked up again, and there before me were four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, and the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, What are these, my lord? The angel answered me, These are the four horses of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. The one with the black horses is going toward the north country, the one with the white horses toward the west, and the one with the dabbled horses toward the south. When the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth, and he said, Go throughout the earth. So they went throughout the earth. Then he called to me, Look, those going toward the north country have given my spirit rest in the land of the north. The eighth vision of Zechariah involved four chariots coming from between two mountains, made of bronze. Mountains carry the idea of strength and power. Thus, these bronze mountains may represent heaven, because the chariots were the four spirits of heaven going out after presenting themselves to the Lord of the whole earth. Some headed north, while others went south to patrol as God had instructed. 
These spirits patrol the planet on the Lord's behalf, keeping an eye out for anything that contradicts the king's goal. Knowing that the God of heaven is always watching over his creation has been a source of comfort to God's people throughout the ages. Having shown Zechariah some previews of the coming kingdom, the Lord then showed him a preview of a preview. This word of the Lord was like a taste of frosting just before it's placed on the cake. God commanded him to take an offering from the exiles. With this silver and gold, they were to make a crown to be placed on Joshua, the high priest. Then Joshua was to be called by the name of Branch, because he would branch out from his place and build the Lord's temple. Not only that, but he would also sit on his throne and rule. The making of the crown symbolizes the unification of the office of priest and king. This was foreshadowed by Joshua, but it would be realized in the Messiah who would rebuild the temple and rule over his kingdom for millennia. On his throne, he will be a priest. The presence of the crown in the Lord's temple served as a reminder of their upcoming Messiah and their responsibility to totally obey the Lord. Gentiles will join in and help to the construction of the temple when the Messiah returns to his kingdom. Apparently, until the temple was built, Zechariah the prophet ministered to the Jewish people and helped them rebuild the temple and challenge their spiritual state. After Zerubbabel's temple was completed, Zechariah continued to stir up trouble until some of his audience had had enough and assassinated him in the exact temple that he had pleaded with the people to finish. Another crucial term in Zechariah is purpose. The prophet feels compelled to remind the people of the greater cause to which they have been sent. Again, he reminds them of the larger picture, as all great leaders do. They aren't just building a structure, they are creating a legacy. In response to queries concerning fasting, Zechariah provides four messages. First, he reproaches the people for engaging in meaningless rites. He then reminds them of their previous misbehavior. Third, he speaks of Israel's redemption. Finally, he emphasizes the restoration of joy inside God's rule. God plays two roles in this text. First, he has Zechariah speak for himself about the need for reform. The prophet exhorts the people to repentance and obedience. He challenges and urges them to keep the commitment they made and expected God to keep. Second, God uses Zechariah to prophesy the future Messiah as the righteous branch, king priest, humble king, cornerstone, good shepherd, and pierced one. By the end of the book, God pledges to return his people and to reside in the midst of Zion. A vision should include a principle for the head and a picture for the heart. Encouragement is vital. You catch more bees with honey than with vinegar. Zechariah is the Old Testament book most frequently and thoroughly quoted in the New Testament in proportion to its length. It is particularly rich in messianic overtones, indicating its significance to the early Christian community. Its place near the end of the canon of the prophets and of the Old Testament era gives the book a forward look, one that already anticipates God's saving work in Christ. The exact location on earth Jesus will return to. One of the most significant inquiries in Christianity is about the timing of Jesus' return. The current state of the world, as seen on the evening news, reinforces the need for the risen Savior to come back. Another crucial question is regarding the place of Jesus' return. According to the Bible, the exact location of Jesus' second coming will be the Mount of Olives. And at that time, the sign of the Son of Man coming in His glory will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth, and especially Israel, will mourn, regretting their rebellion and rejection of the Messiah. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, in brilliance and splendor. Matthew chapter 24, verses 28 through 30. What will Jesus do when he returns? Scripture provides clues about Jesus' return and his first task upon arrival, addressing those gathered to defeat Israel. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2 tells us, 
I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked. Revelation chapter 16 verses 14 and 16 tells us that the battle on the great day of God Almighty will be in the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The exact location of Armageddon is uncertain, as there is no specific mountain named Megiddo. However, the term is interpreted as meaning hill, and it is most likely referring to the hill country surrounding the plain of Megiddo, which is approximately 60 miles north of Jerusalem. In Zechariah chapter 14, it is mentioned that when Jesus returns to earth, he will defeat a confederation of nations that seek to harm Israel, his beloved nation. The reason God gathers these nations together is so that he can battle them all at once in an effective strategy. Zechariah chapter 14 verses 1 through 2 Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you, Jerusalem, will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, and the houses plundered, and the women ravished. And half of the city will be exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Zechariah seems to have the very end times in view, when Jerusalem will be surrounded and attacked by some type of international force. When the Romans came against Jerusalem in A.D. 70, they came with a multinational army and brought terrible destruction on the city and its people. Yet there was none of the deliverance that Zechariah will describe in the following verses, so it is difficult to say that this was fulfilled in the Roman attack upon Jerusalem in A.D. 70. We read, Half the city shall go into captivity. This attack against Jerusalem will be severe, but the city itself will not be overthrown. The remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Zechariah chapter 14 verses 3 through 5 Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives will be split in half from the east to the west by a very large valley, and half of the mountain will move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel, and you will flee, just as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones, believers, angels with him. When it appears that Jerusalem and the people of Israel have lost all hope, the Lord will fight for his people. God is known to demonstrate his power by delivering his people and punishing their enemies. We read, His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. This passage refers to Jesus, the Son of God, returning in a physical form to earth and standing on the Mount of Olives. When this happens, a great crevice will split the Mount of Olives in two, and the oppressed inhabitants of Jerusalem will escape through the valley formed by the split. The Mount of Olives, also known as Mount Olivet, is a ridge of mountains located in East Jerusalem. It lies to the east of Jerusalem's old city and is named after the olive groves that used to cover its slopes. The southern part of the mountain was the Silwan Necropolis, which was believed to have been used for the burial of the elite of the ancient kingdom of Judah. The western slopes of the mountain that are facing Jerusalem have served as a Jewish cemetery for more than 3,000 years, and it holds around 150,000 graves which makes it significant in the tradition of Jewish cemeteries. The Mount of Olives holds great significance in the life of Jesus, as depicted in the Gospels. It is the place where several crucial events occurred and where Jesus ascended to heaven 
according to the Acts of the Apostles. This mount has been a significant site of Christian worship since ancient times, due to its association with Jesus and Mary. The Mount of Olives is a mountain ridge that runs for 3.5 kilometers just east of the Old City, across the Kidron Valley, also known as the Valley of Josaphat. It has three peaks, but Mount Sculpus to the north at 826 meters, the Mount of Olives in the center, and the Mount of Corruption to the south at 747 meters. At Tur is the highest point on the Mount of Olives, rising 818 meters above sea level. An olive tree on the Mount of Olives is believed to be between 800 to 2,000 years old. The ridge serves as a watershed, and its eastern side marks the beginning of the Judean desert. The Holy Scriptures say, Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. According to Revelation chapter 19, verse 14, Jesus will return in glory with all the saints and the armies of heaven, and will touch his feet on the Mount of Olives. Revelation chapter 19, verse 21, describes the outcome of the battle, where the enemies of God are killed with a sword that comes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. Simply put, Jesus wins the victory by speaking, and it is a decisive one. Where exactly will Jesus stand? After his monumental victory over the attacking nations, Jesus will stand on a specific location. Standing on that very mountain will hold great significance for his followers. Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 10 The first account I made, Theophilus, was a continuous report about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he ascended to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given instruction to the apostles, special messengers whom he had chosen. To these men, he also showed himself alive after his suffering, in Gethsemane and on the cross, by a series of many infallible proofs and unquestionable demonstrations, appearing to them over a period of forty days and talking to them about the things concerning the kingdom of God. While well, being together and eating with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, of which he said, You have heard me speak, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized and empowered and united with the Holy Spirit, not long from now. So when they had come together, they asked him repeatedly, Lord, are you at this time re-establishing the kingdom and restoring it to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses to tell people about me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. And after he said these things, he was caught up as they looked on, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. While they were looking intently into the sky as he was going, two men in white clothing suddenly stood beside them. The world is in need of the return of Christ, but according to the Bible, there will be conflicting messages about when and where he will return. Jesus gave his famous Olivet Prophecy about his return while on the Mount of Olives. The question is, where will he return to? What will be the sign of your coming? The disciples of Jesus were very curious about the future, just like many people are today. Jesus detailed a series of events that would happen before his return. Religious deception, wars and rumors of war, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, persecution of Christ's followers, lawlessness. The good news of the kingdom of God will be preached. 
Jerusalem will be surrounded with armies, and the abomination of desolation will be set up. Great tribulation will threaten the existence of humanity. Signs in the heavens. Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 through 22. For at that time, there will be a great tribulation, pressure, distress, oppression, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. And if those days of tribulation had not been cut short, no human life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, God's chosen ones, those days will be shortened. Jesus said that after the tribulation, there will be signs in the heavens, and he will return to the earth with the great sound of a trumpet. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call, for a trumpet will sound, and the dead who believed in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be completely changed, wondrously transformed. In the same way that he left the earth in the clouds, he will return to the earth through the clouds. Many 21st century Christians have been taught that Jesus Christ will come secretly to take the saints to heaven before tribulation. However, the scriptures do not support this theory. According to the Bible, Jesus will return visibly to the earth's surface and not have a secret near return. False Reports of Jesus' Location Jesus explained that before his return, there would be false reports that he had already returned and was in some secret location. He warned us, If anyone tells you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. When Jesus returns, it will be a powerful and glorious event that everyone on earth will witness. His return will not be a secret, but rather, it will be noticed by all the tribes on earth. However, it is surprising that people will not be happy to see their Savior returning. Instead, they will mourn. Where does Jesus go from the Mount of Olives? Jesus will establish his righteous rule worldwide and make Jerusalem his capital, bringing peace and prosperity to all nations. As Micah records, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Micah chapter 4 verses 1 through 2. Pray for Jesus' return, which will be the best news ever. Earlier that day, they had marveled at the impressive stones and intricate workmanship of the temple. However, Jesus had surprised them with a prophecy, and he said to them, do you see all these things? I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, not one stone here will be left on another, which will not be torn down. However, many nations will be deceived and will gather to fight against the Son of God. Discerning the Signs of the Times Jesus Christ pointed out the importance of discerning the signs of the times. Why did he say this, and what are the warning signs of the end times? Biblical Indicators for Discerning the Signs of the Times 
Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his time for failing to recognize the significant events that were happening around them as predicted in the Bible. The Pharisees and Sadducees were testing Jesus, asking him to perform a miracle or show them a sign from heaven as proof of his authority. In response, Jesus pointed out how they could accurately predict the weather, yet failed to understand the prophecies and scriptures. But he replied to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and has a threatening look. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but cannot interpret the signs of the times. Matthew chapter 16, verses 2 through 3. But what about now? Can we discern the biblical signs of our times? The book of Genesis states that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every thought of his heart was only evil continually. The world then was filled with violence as humans corrupted themselves and God's creation. The people of Noah's time disobeyed God's beneficial laws, which caused them to experience automatic pain and suffering. This caused God to feel grieved in his heart, and he decided to start all over again through Noah and his family. Despite the obvious signs of an impending flood, the people ignored Noah's warnings and lived as if nothing were wrong. Signs of Perilous Times the Apostle Paul also listed signs of end-time attitudes to be aware of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5. through He warned that people in the perilous last days will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus reassured his followers by stating four times in the book of Revelation, I am coming quickly. Revelation chapter 3 verse 11, chapter 22 verses 7, 12, and 20. Even during times of hardship and suffering, believers can find comfort and strength in the knowledge that Jesus will return soon. However, since God is eternal, his concept of time is different from ours. Therefore, we may wonder if what he calls quickly will be the same as what we consider soon. It's important to consider the signs that God has given us. Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour. It is impossible to predict with certainty when Jesus will return. According to the words of Jesus, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, which implies that even the most knowledgeable individual is unaware of the exact date and time. Instead of focusing on the precise moment, Jesus wants us to be fervent in our longing for that day. Pray for its arrival and be prepared for it. Once we have done all of these things, we should wait patiently for it to happen. What should we be doing now? It is important to maintain urgency and motivation, even if we do not know exactly when Jesus will return. Jesus warned us not to follow the example of the people of Noah's day. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew chapter 24, verses 38 through 39. Preparing for the Second Coming 
How can we use our time wisely before the coming of Jesus Christ? According to the Bible, there are certain things that we should do. For instance, we should not let the lawlessness of society weaken our love for God, His law, and other people. Verse 12 We must also endure trials and persecution until the end, through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Verse 13 Additionally, we should help in preaching the good news of the kingdom of God in the end times. Verse 14 Lastly, we should avoid becoming lazy and being influenced by the world. Verses 38-39 through 39. Why has Jesus' return taken so long? Why has it taken so long for Christ to return? Why have generations of Christians waited patiently and not yet received the promise? Peter says it is because of God's love. The Lord does not delay, as though he were unable to act, and is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 God is working on His vast and eternal plan. He will provide every human being with a chance to repent and change. For those of us who eagerly await Christ's second coming, it is our duty to share the good news of the kingdom of God with others in these end times. Moreover, it is God's desire that whoever hears of it responds positively. However, this is not the only amazing thing that will occur in Israel. What is Israel's role in the end times? Israel, end times, Antichrist, tribulation. Number one, the Antichrist will make a seven year covenant of peace with Israel. It is common for people to view any conflict in or around Israel as a sign of the approaching end times. However, this attitude may cause us to become desensitized to the ongoing conflict and miss out on recognizing truly significant events when they occur. It is important to understand that conflict in Israel does not necessarily signal the end times. Throughout its existence, conflict in Israel has been a constant reality. The Egyptians, Amalekites, Midianites, Moabites, Ammonites, Amorites, Philistines, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, and Romans have all persecuted the nation of Israel and caused suffering to its people. The Antichrist will make a seven-year covenant of peace with Israel. Angel Gabriel himself warns of this Antichrist to Daniel. This man will prevent further sacrifices and offerings to Jehovah by turning hostile against Israel and on the wing of abominations. Number two, there will be a mass return of Jews to the land of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 11 through 13. For the Lord God says this, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd cares for his flock on a day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples, and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams, and in all the inhabited places of the land. He will be their shepherd and gather them to the land, ruling over them during the millennium. We see God's ministry to his sheep, highlighting the I wills of the Lord God on behalf of his sheep, emphasizing the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. Verse 11, I will search them and seek them out. Verse 12, I will deliver them. Verse 13, I will bring them out. I will gather them together. I will bring them in. Verse 14. 
I will feed them. Number 3. The temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4. Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you. For that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That is, the great rebellion, the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself, so proudly and so insolently, above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Now the Apostle explains why they could not be in that day. According to the Apostle, certain events need to take place before that day arrives. These events will commence after the rapture. Initially, there will be a falling away or an apostasy. This term refers to a complete rejection of Christianity, where individuals abandon their faith entirely. Number 4. The entire world and Israel will finally recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, unmerited favor, and supplication. And they will look at me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him, as one who weeps bitterly over a firstborn. The Lord Jesus Christ, Jehovah, was the one whom they pierced. Mourning for an only son was the deepest form of sorrow for an Israelite. Number 5. Israel will be regenerated restored, and regathered. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 8. I will cleanse them from all their wickedness, guilt, by which they have sinned against me, and I will pardon, forgive all their sins by which they rebelled against me. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 17. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give back to you the land of Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 11, God speaks to the Israelites, assuring them that he will one day bring them back to their homeland and renew their relationship with him. He promises to gather the Hebrew people from the nations where they have been scattered and give them a fresh wholehearted spirit. Number 6. In the last days, many will go to Jerusalem to worship God. Micah chapter 4 verse 2 contains an interesting prophecy that people from around the world will come to Jerusalem to learn about God. It reads, And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law shall go forward from Zion, and the word of the Lord, the revelation about him and his truth from Jerusalem. In order to understand when this prophecy will be fulfilled, it is important to identify the context in which it was written. When the Old Testament prophets refer to the last days, they usually mean the tribulation period or the millennium. In Micah chapter 4, the focus shifts from the theme of judgment in the previous chapter to a theme of future blessings in Jerusalem, when God himself will rule. Micah chapter 4 verse 3. This corresponds with the millennial kingdom, during which the Messiah will reign from his throne in Jerusalem. In addition, we will not become bored. Nations and kings will function in a national context on the new earth, bringing their glory and honor into the city. The new Jerusalem will be the pinnacle of everyone's lives on the new earth, 
and why not, given its magnificence. The Bible actually has many mysteries to uncover. One example is, what animal did God not allow on the ark? To find the answer to that, click here.